Hi everyone, I'm meteorologist Joe Chaffee. <clears throat> I want to uh, say right off the bat today, if um, you're if you like my weather videos, please subscribe to my YouTube page. It's a, it's free to subscribe, and every time I put up a new video, YouTube will send you no notification, so you can just run to um, my channel and watch the latest weather machinations that are going on. Um, also, welcome to those of you from Tri-State Weather, and uh, I hope you enjoy my videos and subscribe to my YouTube channel as well. What I'm going to do today is being that we have two things going on of importance. One is the, um, the fact that a pattern is undergoing a pattern change, and the other thing is the potential for a nor'easter <clears throat> for a, a Sunday night into Monday night, Tuesday of next week. I'm going to cut two separate videos today so that we can I can address um, both issues. We'll do this is going to be a long range video now, and I'll touch a little bit about the nor'easter, and then <clears throat> later on today I will put a second video up uh, with specifically regarding that. So let's take a look first. This is going to be the long range here, and we're starting off <clears throat> with the uh, GFS run. I'm going to use uh, initially. I'm going to start off with the uh, the run from last night and not the in-between run, um, but we'll look at last night's run first. And a couple of things going on. And, you know, whenever you watch something like this, I'll just rotate it very quickly if this is the first time you're seeing it. This is how the atmosphere works. You know, I've always, I've kind of described it as sort of a puzzle. It's kind of like a puzzle on Harry Potter or, or, or how a puzzle on Harry Potter would be, where the pieces would be constantly changing in size and shape as time moved forward so that you have to sort of reconfigure everything and and and, and refigure how the atmosphere is working now there are two primary drivers uh in in this as we go into this weekend in the jet stream pattern um the first thing is that you have this deep trough that's in the west and a series of weather systems and energy uh, involved and some of them are rather strong and the other is uh, the other thing going on is that you have a ridge in the east, but you, in particularly, the strongest part of that ridge, uh, where you have um, the pressures far higher than what they normally would be, that's up in eastern Canada. So this kind of creates a bit of a blocking setup. You've you've got um, a ridge out in the Atlantic as well. Uh, when, what I mean by a block is literally. A block. It's something in the atmosphere that shows up that prevents a <clears throat> a normal west to east flow, which causes um, upheaval in 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 a lot of respects of the atmosphere. If you're in a in the right spot under a block, especially in the springtime, you could have great weather. If you're in the wrong spot, you can be uh, miserable for many days at a time. So right now, um, we're kind of in that sort of miserable for many days at a time mode. I think the amount of sunshine we're going to see locally here in the Northeast is going to be severely limited because of the fact that uh, the wind is going to be on shore for a while. But we'll just watch what happens. In terms of what the block does, it forces this next weather system really to kind of, instead of maybe lifting up or, or just kind of staying out in the west, it forces it underneath. And you can see what it, it starts to lift up along the east coast. So that's going to be the a nor possible nor'easter. But over time, what happens is that the block forces the upper air pattern in Canada to change. And, and now we're, you know, into day eight and nine, where we're starting to see some semblance of a flow coming out of, of northwest Canada. That would be a colder flow. I'm going to throw some caution on that in just a second, and I'll explain why. But um, when we look at this and we take it over time, uh, you can see what gradually happens is that the flow in Canada really takes over. And you've got a strong, by the time we get to day, um, the, the end of the second week here, so now we're just barely into the first days of February, you have a well-established flow from the north. Now, you still also have a fairly active Pacific jet. So we're going to have to see over time what that means in terms of potential storminess down the road. I would really caution unequivocal statements regarding what the outcome is going to be, in my view, uh, really don't have a lot of value 
you know, I keep hearing and seeing people, oh, you know, we have an epic pattern setting up for snow and cold. Well, you know what? It may not be. Um, I would point out that epic patterns are epic because they tend to happen once every 20 or 30 years, not once every two or three weeks. So if something is going to become epic, quote unquote, you'll know it after the fact, not before. And I don't think it gains anybody, uh, makes anybody a real hero by coming out time and again, um, saying that, you know, epic, we have an epic pattern, we have an epic pattern. Well, you know what, broken clocks are right twice a day. If you keep saying something long enough, eventually it's going to be right. Um, but that's, that's me, you know, I, I save it for when it's genuinely um, appropriate. And I don't think it really, I think it rarely is. Uh, that's my never to be a uh, little never be a uh, little old never be to be humble opinion now let's i want to show you what this translates to in the short range because in the shorter range uh and on the surface because there are <clears throat> implications here and let's roll back um now here's the potential nor'easter uh, that we're going to uh talk about it comes out of the southern plains and you see it right there and, you know, there's going to be some question as to how it gets handled when it goes into the eastern states, but it will produce a big wind and rain event for somebody. Again, I'll have more on that later. In the west, we have another big storm coming in that's going to bring some big snows to California, and you can see them here on the GFS model. Um, this is uh, going in through the late weekend and early next week, so we really have two big storms going on. And then that translates out into the Rockies and Central Plains with a fairly decent snowfall as this low starts to come east. And that's going to be the catalyst, um, the first of a couple of cold fronts to come through that start to make things colder. And, and there's a front that goes by, and then there's another one with a wave on it. It looks like the cold air gets in after that wave goes by. We're at day eight here, day eight, day nine, which is next Friday. And then after that, it starts to turn, you know, gradually colder. And it looks like we have successive weather fronts, or, uh, cold fronts that will be coming through with a, a colder air mass behind each one. And I'm going to tell you that even though the upper air pattern, the upper air part of the atmosphere begins to look cold um, toward the end of next week, it may take a little longer for that cold air to play out. And here's the reason why. I'm going to widen out back to that wide view. And I want the problem is that all through this week and all through the beginning of next week, this is the showing above normal temperatures and below normal temperatures. The below normals are in blue and, and the um, uh, above normals are in the yellows and reds and oranges and so on. So if you notice that all of Canada is above normal temperature wise, now that relative to us, that air would still probably be cold, but this is not really cold air. It isn't until we get later in the period that you start to see uh, that uh, warm air begin to, that warmer than normal air begin to disappear. So now we're into day nine here, and we're still seeing above normal temperatures uh, up through Canada, even though the first in a series of cold fronts comes through. It's going to take uh, at least another four, four or five days for the that warm air to kind of get transferred out and spent so it's not until the end of the period into the first two days of february that you start to get into some uh, near or below normal temperatures in other words the first air that's coming down into the northeast is going to be the air that's up here now that is not that cold so that has to be shipped down and moved out gradually what happens in canada as the upper air jet stream deepens uh, and the vortex deepens is that colder air is produced and you finally get a profile that is near or below normal in Canada and then that air will come down. So it's going to be a work in progress. Try and bear in mind that when it comes to pattern changes, uh, they are rarely uh, events that that turn on a dime. It just doesn't suddenly change over a day or two. There usually are long grinding processes that take 10 days to two weeks to play out. Sometimes you need one big storm to sort of be the catalyst. If you have that, it could ha the pattern change would have it faster. Uh, if, um, if you don't have that, then it becomes this kind of long grinding process. And the fact that we lack a major storm uh, on, on the models going up 
uh, into Canada and kind of sort of cyclonically generating some cold air and, and helping to eat away at this uh, warm air that's up there. There's no way to, um, w you know, get rid of that unless you just, you know, move it. And, you know, that's kind of what's what the atmosphere is doing. Uh, when we look at the upper levels, of, see, when we look at the upper levels of the atmosphere, and I'm going up now, going up to the 5,000 foot level where people don't live, um, you can see that the uh, 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 below normal uh, temperatures aloft are much more extensive, and the above normal temperatures aloft are much less extensive. Um, and again, we need to have that cold air brought down, worked down toward the surface, and that just takes time. So my 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 bottom line is when I look at all the models, be it the GFS or the European or the Canadian, they all uh, are pretty much uh, on the same page here. I really don't see. Um, too much difference um, with regards to that. I, I'm not a huge fan of the ensembles per se, um, but uh, when we look at the ensemble models, uh, they are certainly favoring colder than normal temperatures. In fact, the ensembles are even much colder than the operational models. For those of you who don't know what ensembles are, the ensembles of a given model, there's the model that, that goes out, the final product model, the operational model, that's what you see. And then there's kind of, there's all sorts of different variations of that model. Each has a parameter that, or two that's different from the other. And what you, what you do with them is like, say there's 20 of them that you kind of average it all out and see where they take you. So, you know, my own view on ensembles generally is the fact that, um, you know, if you use averages to make decisions, you're going to make, you're going to get average results. But one thing that struck me about the, uh, ensembles today was the fact that they you know when I look at what the upper air is showing um, they're clustered pretty tightly and actually this is a fairly cold look for the ensembles so I'm thinking that a number of the different members of the group are, are pretty close together so um, that to me is a signal that that uh, this is this is still on course to happen and when we look at that's the um, the GFS when we look at the Canadian ensemble, you know, it's kind of the same idea. Maybe the magnitude is a little bit less. Every model is kind of is a different, uh, you know, idea of what's going on. The storminess part of the pattern, I think, is a different animal to figure out. There's a lot more variability in that. And I think that's more of a short range problem. So let's leave it at that. Um, if you are interested, I have a, a weather uh, forecast app. Um, that has my forecast on it, um, and you can download that and subscribe. Uh, the download is free, and it's just a buck a month, and you can get specific forecasts uh, written at least twice a day by me, a human being, not some icon thing, uh, for New York, New Jersey, uh, Long Island, Connecticut, the Hudson Valley, and Eastern Pennsylvania. Uh, the link is going to be up here on the video if you'd like. And again, if you've watched it for this long, um, thank you very much. Uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel, which is absolutely free. And you can also find me on Facebook, Meteorologist Joe Chaffee, and on my website, MeteorologistJoeChaffee.com. I'll have a short-range video uh, to look at the potential nor'easter threat a little later today.